I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and today we're gonna dye a homemade blank, homemade sock blank, which is weird to call this a sock blank because it's made out of worsted weight yarn, so really it should just be a blank. Um, this is a blank I made on my, it looks like from the width, my Loops and Threads knitting machine, a plastic crank knitting machine that I got from Michaels. And this is Wool of the Andes worsted weight yarn that is 100% uh, Peruvian Highland wool. And today we're gonna donut it, which means that I'm gonna fold the edge, and just like a sweater, we're gonna keep cuffing it until we end up with a donut-looking object. And what this does is allow, it's sort of like when I do cake dyeing, where you get some really different ways that the dyes will strike to the outside versus the inside. But I really don't know if I've done this on non-superwash yarn. I feel like most of these that I've done have been superwash. Um, and we have a little bit of the edge sticking out. I can sort of roll it one more time so the edge is in the center a little bit. But anyway, here is the donut. Now because it's folded, there are different areas of the yarn that will have more access to dye and less. The yarn at the outside is a little bit stretched. The dye will be able to get through a few layers out here really easily. And over the top and bottom, a little bit more easily. The yarn that is in the center, not the center like right here, but the center within like one side, like so deep in here, there there's more resist. It's gonna be a little bit harder for dyes to get in, which should give us some really cool patterning when we open this up in the end. But now let's go look at some dye colors and we'll mix some things together. Today my mind is giving me a little bit of a warm color palette. Uh, I have some 1% stock solutions of Dharma's Oxblood Red, Pecan Brown, Hot Fuchsia, oh wait, this is Jacquard's Hot Fuchsia, and then this is maybe like a 0 0.33, 0.4% um, stock solution of Dharma's Chartreuse. Uh, this bottle started with 50 milliliters of a 1% stock solution and then filled with water. So it's not as potent as these other colors, but let's mix them together a little bit randomly. I have a little graduated a beaker right here, and I'm gonna pour colors in. The goal is to not have more, I think, than 50, I definitely don't think I want 50 milliliters of dye total, or 50 milliliters should be a fine amount. Because the colors strike asymmetrically, at least a bit, Oh, I, I forgot that this is the hot fuchsia. This color is gonna break. Editing Rebecca clarification, hot fuchsia does not break. It is a primary, but it strikes really slow. So in the mixture I'm mixing, the colors will likely break because some of the other colors like the oxblood and the brown will strike faster and the hot fuchsia will strike slower. And so because that strikes so slowly and it's non superwash, I don't want to use a lot because I don't want to have a ton of pink in the dye bath in the end. Back to the video. So I added, I think less than five milliliters of that. Uh, if we have too much dye, then we could end up with a lot of bleeding and we really, really don't want that. Uh, adding a bit more brown. I'm curious what this color is looking like right now. Not that things are well mixed. Ooh. Ooh, that color is so unbelievably pretty. Oh my gosh, I wish I knew what the ratios were, but it gives us sort of a, gosh, a lovely like maroon color. I almost hate, so we're at about 35 milliliters of our 1% stock solutions. And I'm gonna bring this up to 50 milliliters with the chartreuse color, which again, is not as concentrated as those other colors. So, and again, I haven't exactly mixed this, so this may not be the most accurate depiction of the color, but what we had before the green was that like red. 
Ooh. After the green, it's still very red, but oh, they're very similar. Very, very similar, but very pretty. Very pretty. Okay. I am, I need to wait for a pot so that way I can use a dye bath, but I'm very excited to see this color on our donut. Here we have 16 cups of water. And I want it to be hot, I think, before I add our non superwash donut. <laughs> because I want uh, some of the colors to start striking on the outside pretty quickly. Now to this, I'm going a little bit higher for acid, and I'm adding about half a cup of white vinegar. That's around 120 milliliters, which would be like eight tablespoons of white vinegar, I think. If a tablespoon is 15 milliliters, yes, that would be eight tablespoons of white vinegar. Uh, let's bring over our dye. I'm really excited about this color. And since things haven't heated up yet, that's how I can rinse out this little plastic beaker in here. But if you wanna learn more about any of the tools or equipment that I use in my videos, I will have links and affiliate links down in the video description. And I may make a commission if you make a purchase through one of my affiliate links. But now I just gotta wait for this to heat up. The dye bath is warm and as I add our yarn, I'm gonna try really, really hard to not touch it a lot. So let's add it on. I mean, as I touched it then, we may need to touch it to help it sink in, but usually Wool of the Andes is pretty absorbent. Uh, not a lot is happening. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I did give it a little push. Hopefully this will help it continue to sink in. We're not really sinking in. Very buoyant. So I will help. Let me grab my tongs. I know I said I wasn't gonna help, but I thought that it was gonna sink in like really quickly versus just sort of bobble. But we can help. I mean, we're still very much floating and it's possible that we have like wet yarn towards the center still. But like as I'm pressing, I'm really just trying to put it under water. I'm not squeezing it. There we go. Okay, we are mostly submerged now. <laughs> oh, but it looks really cool. Okay, so now all I can do is wait. And I think I'll set a timer for 30 minutes, but it may take longer. We may need to bring in a yarn mop or something because there's not very much surface area and we have a reasonable amount of dye in here. It could just take a little bit more time for things to strike. But let's cross our fingers and wait and I'll see you in 30 minutes. It's been 30 minutes and most of the color is in our donut and I don't want to press my luck. <laughs> I don't want to press my luck because I don't want to have a bleeder on my hands here. So what I'm going to do is remove the blank. Ooh, ooh, this is already really pretty. Very like vintagey. Of course I did add green and brown to red, but I like this color combination. All right, I'm going to set this aside to cool and bring over another skein of Wool of the Andes. So again, this is 100% Peruvian Highland wool to leave no dye behind. Now there's a little bit of dye around the rim of the pot. So I don't know if that'll come in and stain, but <laughs> there's a lot less color in here than I thought. But you know, sometimes it's really fun to just show how much or little color there is, even if you get something that is incredibly pastel. Uh, maybe this will be a yarn that could pair really well with our other yarn. <laughs> I mean, there's still color in there. We haven't soaked it all up, but this is, this is like a, the whitest blush pink. I truly thought there was more pigment in there. But anyway, uh, I'm going to heat this for 30 minutes. <laughs> it's been 30 minutes. 
And I'm gonna turn off the heat. I am floored <laughs> with how pastel this is. I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful blush pink. It's gonna go so well with the yarn from our donut, but I really felt like there was more color there. Oh my gosh, on camera, it's looking extremely neutral. I promise there's color in here. If I need to, I'll bring more bare yarn in the end. But I'm gonna go set this aside to cool. I'll probably wash this one off camera. Here is our donut and let's untwist it. But oh, before we do, I mean, even just look at that shift. Okay, I wanna have it so that way the right side is on the outside. Ooh. See how the color transitions from light to dark again, and more light and more dark. Ooh, this is so pretty. Now, I don't always unravel sock blanks that I dye in the episode, but for a homemade blank, I definitely will unravel it because uh, <laughs> there are more imperfections. and. Oh my gosh, it's hard to show you everything right now. Once it's dry, I'll be able to show a little better, but see how we alternate dark and light patches, but the size of the dark patch is big, and it gets smaller, and a little smaller, and a little smaller as we go down. Oh, this worked so well. So we still have a gradient here. It's just our gradient as I start to wash it, and I'll use a little bit of some clear dish soap. Oh, I mean, I guess I use a lot. Um, oh, but this is so exciting uh, because I wasn't sure if I'd get enough resist with the non super wash yarn to get something that had drama in it. Now, there is a little bit of color coming out, and well, our yarn mop which I'll wash off camera in a minute. <laughs> it's a lot lighter than the lightest color here, but it does go well with it. It actually would contrast with the whole thing really, really well if you had both of them. But now we have to cross our fingers that we're not gonna continue to see bleeding. And we don't, phew. So I'm gonna finish rinsing out the soap I'll wash the yarn mop off camera, and then I'm gonna put this through my spin dryer and hang it up to dry so we can look at the full pattern and really appreciate it. Here is our homemade sock blank, uh, sock blank tube that was in a donut, and look at that variation. Uh, you can see where we had the yarn on the outside and how these dark patches get a little bit smaller and lighter, smaller and lighter as we go to the inside of the blank. And it gives this like really soft silk striping, almost like gradient fractal kind of feel to it. Now, before I forget, here's our leave no dye behind skein. Uh, I think here you can actually feel the blush color that it is. And so maybe I don't need to go grab a bare skein of yarn to have in comparison. It is a very, very subtle, soft pink, but in combination with the other yarn, gives a really beautiful sort of vintage feel. And I do wonder, we're gonna be unraveling this blank anyway. Okay, but if I pull this apart, we are gonna see some reverse speckles. And I wonder if that light pink color in there is the same as this. That would be cool. So now it's time for me to go unravel the blank, and I need to figure out which end. Okay, this is the cast on end, I can tell, uh, because I can see the over under, and did I draw, oh, did I draw through just one stitch? Am I gonna be able to just unravel it like this? Yes, I am. I even put a safety line through. <laughs> now, I sort of mentioned that there might be a little bit of modeling, and you can see a little bit of that right here wrapped around my hand, and that's just because there's some resist from the stitches themselves. But anyway, I'm gonna go unravel this blank onto a Knitty Knotty so we can see, I guess, the color progression. Normally I don't unravel blanks, but if it's one that I made myself, I'm gonna unravel it because I should take responsibility for any snags and whatnot in it, you know? 
the progression of the yarn on the Nitty Naughty mirrors what we saw before. We see some darker areas, some lighter areas, and they transition in a back and forth way where the dark sections get smaller and smaller and the lights get a little bigger and bigger. And from here you can really see that reverse speckling really, really well. Our Leave No Dye Behind skein is probably a little bit paler than our donut overall, but I think that the two would pair together really, really well because it would still give you some contrast. And I feel like a white wouldn't go very well with this. I think that this subtle pink would look really cool. If you wanted to do color work with it, that is. I had to find the end so that way I can take the yarn off the Nitty Naughty. And well, we see the ramen noodle state. At the end of the video, I will go ahead and soak this in some water to help relax that crimp a little bit. It'll still have a little bit of wave, but it won't be as ramen as it is right now. I also popped a zip tie on just so that way things won't get tangled. But I'm gonna twist this which will be approximately what it might look like in my shop. I promise this yarn is a blush pink. See how that zip tie still there? It's just a little bit hidden. Now twist it up. It's hard I think to see that this yarn has that gradient quality to it. I think that's why it's really handy to show what a blank or something looks like before it's unraveled. And this one had no problem unraveling at all. I have had some blanks that have required a little bit more effort to unravel in the ones that I've made myself. And so that's why I always unravel my handmade blanks, especially because this one I think I made a really long time ago. I didn't make it specifically for this video, so I don't have any issues from making the blank fresh in my brain or anything like that. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and I love all things yarn. I love to play around with different techniques, different color combinations, different fiber types to explore just the different types of effects we can get on yarn. And sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work, but I try to share it no matter what because I feel like we can all learn from it either way. So please subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. And if you want some other ways to help support the content here, go and check out the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop for hand dyed yarn that's been featured in my videos. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and thank you so much for watching.